We love life itself. We think the organization is so powerful and doing really, really good work. So we're thrilled to cross pollinate between our communities. And um, Elizabeth and I are both lifelong, um, passionate interest in community living. In fact, Elizabeth's house in Costa Rica in an intentional community is literally done like right now, right, Elizabeth? Yeah. The refrigerator was just delivered. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, so we're thrilled to be here. Um, we're gonna share a some slides and we'll kind of turn them on and off so that um, they don't take up the whole screen all the time. But we're talking today about building a business as an ecosystem and how to create a thriving business partnership specifically, really in like the spirit of community. So if you haven't met us before, I'm Micah, I'm the founder of Wink and Elizabeth is the CEO of Wink. And, you know, while we're kind of introducing ourselves in this next little section, if you haven't shared with us in chat, like what brought you to this conversation today, we'd be really interested to know, like, what are the specifics that have talking about business partnership, um, you know, worth your time and attention today. So let us know in chat. Elizabeth, do you want to introduce Wink for anyone who? Sure. I mean, I know almost everyone on video, which is so fun. <laughs> um, so we got a lot of our Wink community here, which is awesome. But just to recap, so Micah founded Wink in 2011, and we partnered together in January of 2017. So we have been partners for six full years now, and it has been pretty much seamless. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, we teach a proven four-part system that helps heart-centered on entrepreneurs grow their businesses. We've taught this system to over 15,000 women across the globe. And as far as just a little under the hood of our partnership, we alternate who is driving the ship as far as the strategy and marketing and who is working with more customers. So we're always flipping roles back and forth and very clear in our lanes but at the same time, our first priority is always taking care of each other. So even when I'm in over here and I'm trying to take responsibility for something, Micah will inevitably come in and be like, how can I help you? How can I help you? Which is just one of the most beautiful things about our partnership. Um, we've had close to 700 women from, um, this is 26 countries, but I looked at our website and I think it said 30. 36 countries, so I'm not actually sure, <laughs> but a lot that have graduated from our 90-day program um, over the last several years, um, including myself in 2014. That's sort of the origin story of how I found Wink. Not sure if that's if we're going to that right yet. Okay, I just made this slide because I thought it was so cute. Um, you know, uh, just as business partners, Micah and I are really life partners um, in so many ways. And we take care of each other like family. Um, we celebrate together like family. Like she's the first person I think of when I'm scared and I need support. I'm like, I gotta call my dad. Um, and so I never could have imagined that having a business partner could, could bring me um, such a deep form of support and community. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, community, like the definition of community really, I think is people who, um, who need each other. Mm -hmm. And then actually it's really hard to have community if there's no shared need and our fate, the fate of our families is tied together. Like there's no way for us and nor would we want to, for us to unweave the way that we depend on each other. And that's part of what makes it so intimate and beautiful. And I'm sure Lauren can speak to like how that's true in, in all kinds of partnership and all kinds of community. Um, so I don't know, maybe for Christmas, I'll print that slide for you and <laughs> put it on the wall. Um, so um, let me check time to make sure I don't spend too much time here. So um I came to Wink as a student. I had a five-year-old graphic design, web design, and high-end printing business. 
Um, we were grossing over six figures, but most of that money was not coming back to my family. I was exhausted and demoralized and I felt really alone. I was in business with my husband, but um, I was really the strategic brains of the operation, which wasn't saying much at that point because <laughs> we weren't operating very strategically, but I felt really overwhelmed and really alone. Um, and I was, I remember thinking like, there's just not enough money here for our family. And yet I physically can't work any harder. And, um, then I ran into one of my entrepreneurial friends at the grocery store named Marcy and she, uh, we were just kind of comparing notes, um, on the battlefield of entrepreneurship. And she told me about Micah and Wink. And, um, so long story short, I came to a free workshop. I think there's a picture of it. Like I, we actually, she had a, um, camera crew there that day. And so um, just by chance, I'm sitting here, I'm like the third one in right there, right? So um, I came to this workshop and the second I walked in the room and saw Micah, like my whole body was like, oh my gosh, I love this woman. Like there was just a deep resonance and, um, and hope was sort of ignited for me as I got to feel her expertise in the, in the workshop. And I don't know if you want to say anything about that day like it was like a romantic comedy it was it was she walked in the room we took one look at each other and it was love at first sight we both just got like this such this zing and um in in retrospect it's all played out in such a profound way that it makes that moment even more magical but it was it was obvious in the first second really yeah yeah yeah, I just remember calling my husband so excited. I was like, I think I found the woman who can help us. Um, and so I you know, went to the workshop and then I went through Wink's 90 day program a few months later and um, it was able to help me. There's a lot of women here who have been through our program, but um, it was able to help me take all the piecemeal business knowledge and experience I had and put it in this really powerful framework that we teach. So all of a sudden I was like, Oh, I know a lot about business. Oh, I'm, I can really take this and run with it. So working with Micah in the 90 day program really helped me transform the business that I was in at the time and really increase our profit margins and increase my quality of life. Um, in such beautiful ways and kind of give me some breathing room. Um, but I think it also, you know, made it really clear that um, I was actually really good at business. I just didn't have a framework to put it inside of yet. And so it was like turning on the lights for me. Um, and so long story short, like Wink is a very connected community, especially in Colorado where before COVID, we we did monthly events, I mean, every month for years and years. Um, and so Micah and I kept in touch and she was kind of tracking what I was up to when I was moving into helping other mothers with businesses try to manage it all because that was the nut that I was trying to crack for myself with two little ones and a business. And um, so I think I want to pass it to you here that like at a certain point, Micah just called me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 2016 so, probably. Right. That's right. So it's cool to see in chat, you know, where, um, what's bringing all of you here and the desire for a partnership can be very diverse. Um, for me, when I was about five, six years into building wink, and that was after I had worked with Elizabeth, I just knew that Wink was at a place where like, if I didn't bring in a business partner, it would just stay in the same place because I was only capable of doing what I was capable of. Um, there was already a small operational team, but so I set my sights on bringing in a business partner. And one of the things that we want to talk about before um, we talk about what's worked for Elizabeth and I is talking about what happened the first time I tried because it actually didn't work. And there was a, some really big lessons learned. So first, you know, I knew I wanted to find a business partner. I identified oh, another woman. I went to her and 
Um, one of the things I would definitely say this, so I'm going to kind of go down a rabbit hole for a second is that we are very, very big on financial and legal agreements. That is a real value that we hold. Um, not just because we want to focus on the worst case scenario, but because we think clear financial, legal, and um, financial and legal agreements are likely to save a relationship, to give it the best possibility of thriving, because a lot of the hard stuff has been talked about and worked out and written down on paper um, before doing work together. So with that value, I went to this um, potential business partner, and the first thing that we did is we spent a lot of time talking about the financial and legal agreement around ownership. And that, for me, is a, is a case study in definitely what to do. So I know we have women and or people in this community that are all over the world. So your specific country is, you know, very different landscape than perhaps the U.S. But in the U.S., something really important to know is that if you don't put a legal and financial agreement down on paper, then by default, if you were to have um, a disagreement that ended you two in court, the default legal situation is that you will be seen as 50-50. So for me as a business owner at this time, if I had brought someone in just to collaborate with me inside of my business, just to do a collaborative project, but I didn't put in writing the legal and financial agreement, if any disagreement happened, that person could technically end up with 50% of my company. So um, the lesson learned from this first attempt at business partnership was a year into talking about the legal and financial agreement and ownership structure, we were still talking about the financial and legal ownership structure and zero work had been done. And all of a sudden, I just realized, wait a minute here, like we've spent a year in this conversation and there's been no results produced. There's been no, um, we don't even know if we like working together yet. Like there's nothing here except for kind of a waste of time. So I offer this to you as sort of this like two sides of the coin. We're on one side, financial and legal agreements in our opinion are non-negotiable at the beginning. And on the other hand, what I learned in this, in this case study example is the downside to just this endless conversation about the financial and legal. So um, that partnership did not work. And that's when, you know, picking off on what Elizabeth um, was saying at the end of her last share, um, I had been tracking Elizabeth and what she had been up to and how had she continued to evolve um, since we formally worked together. And I just knew that she was a really likely candidate for being business partners together. And that's because I saw three really essential ingredients that I think are often, you know, really important for a great business partnership. Now, this is my opinion. This is Elizabeth and I's experience. It might be different from you, but for, you know, food for thought. Um, so number one, Elizabeth and I had this enormous uh, appreciation and respect for each other. Like we actually liked each other. And you know, to go into partnership with someone is a very intimate long-term process. So um, that is a really big deal to just literally like them and respect them. <laughs> um, secondly, I was very clear, and this is what might be different for anyone else. You know, it might be nuanced for you, but I was super clear what skill like very unique integration of skill sets that someone um, running Wink and working with our customers would have to have. And I was clear about that. So that clarity was an essential ingredient, ingredient because I could look at Elizabeth and say, she has got this very unique combination of skill sets and character that will make her good at what this company needs. 
Plus she had complementary skills to me that I didn't have. So she had what we needed plus more. So that was the second essential ingredient. And then the third one is um, to run a company requires a lot of financial responsibility and know-how, financial integrity. So the third ingredient for a great business partner, in my opinion, is like, how is their financial house? Is it in order? Are they integrous with money? Are they responsible in their financial life? I wouldn't go into business partnership with someone who was not responsible already in that domain. And so we'll just take a brief moment to feel into like what of those three ingredients are true for you that you want to take forward. Are there others that you know that you really need? So clarity on the exact kinds of skills that your partner needs and also what other skills that you don't have are they bringing? How is their financial house? And do you genuinely like and respect them? A little bit of a, you know, tough, um, tough love moment is like considering how you are in your financial life. Because in our opinion, that will reflect um, one aspect of how solid of a business partner you can be for someone else. Yeah, and I, I think just like any other relationship we might enter into, like romantic relationship, some people search for a business partner out of kind of desperation or uh, like there's problems to solve. And I think that that's really just setting you up to have like two chickens with their head cut off kind of. <laughs> and so this financial integrity piece um, really spans across like all life organization. And Micah and I were both capable and had proven that we could create results on our own and that we could kind of um, organize and manage a business on our own. And so together we were able to just amplify rather than one of us like frantically looking for a solution and then dragging someone else into their into their mess, which mm -hmm. like often happens, you know, in, in all kinds of relationships, not just business partnerships, but yeah. So I know that's, it's very sensitive, especially because sometimes women will be like, this person wants to partner with me, but she's kind of like, you know, um, so yeah, just to kind of expound on that point of the sort of integrity and um, um, responsibility, like a sense of being responsible um, in your life, good mm -hmm. at adulting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So I reached out to Elizabeth to explore partnership, but what I took from the experience of what didn't work in the first attempt, we used that learning and we did a very different approach to begin our partnership. So where we found the reconciliation is that we absolutely started with a financial and legal agreement but we didn't drive headlong into the ownership structure to, of that financial agreement to start. Instead, we took a project-based approach to see if we could work together well. So instead of our financial and legal agreement being about the long-term ownership structure of the company as partners, we did a contractor agreement and said, we are going to do this bite-sized project in this limited amount of time. The legal structure is as, you know, Elizabeth as a contractor to the company and the financial structure is basically very specific um, result metrics that we are, are aiming to achieve together. And if those metrics have been achieved, here is the financial profit sharing of those results. Does that make sense how we reconciled making sure we had a legal and financial agreement, but we took it as a bite-sized project to start? And so the first round of the project went great. 
So we did another round of a specific bite-sized project. That went great. Then we did another round of a specific bite-sized project and that went great. And by that point, we were a year into this exploration and we had proven results. We had a lived experience that we loved working together. Um, we were, the company was better. Our lives were better as partners. And so those were all green lights. At that point, a year in, I handed the entire company over to Elizabeth to run. Like full stop, 100%. Overnight, she took the reins of the entire company. And that was a really powerful thing that allowed um, her to take her, really take her seat in the company. And it allowed me to find out a lot um, about my capacity to share power. <laughs> um, and so our situation is a little bit unique because there was an existing company that had been in, in business for seven years when Elizabeth came in. That's really different than if you're starting a partnership from the beginning. But in either case, um, both Elizabeth and I had our own versions of finding out about sharing power in this process. So for me, it was like kind of, can I hand over my baby and let someone else have a full decision-making seat at the table? Or is that going to be hard for me? Um, for Elizabeth, you know, do you want to speak to what it was like for you, like your version of that? Yeah. I mean, I had been a founder of companies. I had been an entrepreneur since 22 and I had always been the founder. And so for me, there was a dance of like finding ownership in something that I hadn't founded. And could I feel like, was my ego okay with feeling, um, like, could I take ownership without it having been my originating from me? I'm not explaining it very well, but um, it was, it was a different, yeah, a different dynamic. And can I take ownership while still honoring, you know, that you had like honoring everything that came before me? Yeah. Yeah. So in a way we both actually had to submit like mm -hmm. surrender like I had to surrender my executive leadership role by myself into partnership and share that power. Elizabeth had to like submit her being the leader that made all the decisions into being a partner. And so the thing we want to say about this is that, um, this part of the equation provides a lot of information if you can let it show you yourself in the process. You might find out it was easier to share power than you thought. You might find out it was harder than you thought. You might find out it was easier in one part, harder in another part. And if together you can approach that crucible as giving you a lot of information to grow with and a lot of um, opportunity for self-reflection, then you might have the experience like us that it was like sensitive, it was tender, it was um, a potent crucible, and it ended up being like extremely rich because we were willing to learn the lessons from the information we were getting around our relationship to power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one thing that was really, um, really pulled us through this time, if and when we were tussling with our own e ego issues and power was the, um, we both got to feel the other person showing up with kind of this like radical generosity. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I felt my ego because that's all it really was like, oh gosh, who am I if I'm not the number one, if I'm like the number two, right? <laughs> um, 
I got to feel this radical generosity of Micah essentially letting me earn my place in the company without capital investment. And she got to feel the generosity of me showing up and working for the first couple of years on a profit sharing margin where I was putting in like a lot, a lot of sweat equity. So we both got to feel the other one show up in um, for each other and mm -hmm. show up with like this radical generosity that made the power sharing to me like not an issue mm -hmm. you know if anything i would be floored over and over like oh my god i can't believe she's just like how how little issue there is with power sharing um mm -hmm. because i know how how much wink meant to you and means to you and how hard you worked to get to where you got before I arrived and so um keeping that radical generosity and um front of mind I think helped us navigate any of that like tussle if and totally. when it came up totally that's right and vice versa because Elizabeth did come in and put so much sweat equity in before she was really getting a a um, a financial payout that was equal to all the work she was doing in that early chapter. And that allowed my nervous system to feel like she was really for the best of the company and the best of the partnership and the best of our clients and really committed to a result oriented outcome um, before asking to take ownership of something that she hadn't been there in the beginning for. So that was right. her generosity. And so as we keep going, some of our key points that we're going to talk about later is like, this is just one of many examples of how we invested generously and how that built trust over time for both of us. Um, and that part is tricky because Lots of women and men too throw themselves under the bus and abandon themselves in a process like this <laughs> and then find out that they're left holding the like short end of the stick. So this is a really tricky place. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the way that we consistently were generous with each other that allowed us both to keep feeling safe to it, to be generous. Um. So that really leads to one of the most amazing examples here. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, if you want to talk about this, because it this was this was not something that we set out to do. This was something that many years in, we discovered, we became aware of what we were already doing that was working so well. And it is really it's been probably one of the biggest things. So Elizabeth, do you want to talk about it? Yeah. And I, I mean, I think this is so unique because it's so personal because it, it, it takes two to time mm -hmm. and go. Right? So it really is about the dynamic you have with the other person. But um, when we did finally get into negotiating our ownership contract, I mean, Micah had been referring to me as her business partner and operating like as a complete open book from the very first day that we began working together. But it was it was several years before we finalized our legal partnership agreement. And um, it's really the only thing in our working together day in and day out for six years that felt challenging. Like those were the, the conversations that felt that felt hard and I felt triggered um because it was activating so much of our primal fear for both of us because the lawyer's like okay worst case scenario in this area worst case scenario in this area and trying to get us to imagine essentially if we were in partnership with someone who is not Micah <laughs> and not me right like okay well you have this great trust now but what if this happens and so it was really triggering and like there was some really hard conversations and we took our time, like we took a long time with the whole process. And I noticed what would happen for me is I, when I would get contracted in that fear, I would imagine what it would feel like from Micah's perspective. 
And then I would, we would sleep on it a lot and we would come back to the conversation the next day. And I was thinking, and I would say like, okay, I've been thinking a lot about this and um, I want it to be fair to you because blah, blah, blah. So I think we should do this. And I would advocate for whatever was best for Micah. And meanwhile, she would have done the same thing. And she's like, yeah, but what's best for you is ba 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 And this still happens like probably weekly yeah. where I'm like, okay, but the company owes you this money. And you're like, no, because we've got to fund our savings account. I'm like, no, we're not funding our savings account until we pay you what we owe you. Like <laughs> we're all constantly like arguing for the other person's benefits. Yeah. And so I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that she always has my back and I always have her back and I want to have her back. And then it becomes this, um, this self-fulfilling cycle where like, I want to have her back even more because I know I don't have to watch my own back because she's watching my back. Mm -hmm. And so there, 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 it takes us outside of a framework of scarcity and into a framework of like, the more I take care of you, the more you take care of me. And like, that's what our species, that's, that's the mindset our species needs to adopt in this high stakes moment on earth. And it just feels, I mean, so beautiful. Like a lot of times I'm like, no, we are not doing that. You are not taking care of me that way. But the fact that she suggests it even, <laughs> um, it's just like, yeah, just knowing we, um, that you always have my back is like amazing. I want to, I want, I want to hear you, you talk about it now. Yeah. I mean, you said everything so well, it's just like, I'll summarize, but like pretty much, I mean, this happens in a lot of areas, right? It kind of happens across the board, but I really want to call attention specifically around financial stuff where money is involved, where it's like, who gets how much money? who, you know, like that is one of the places where like our nervous system response of I'm not safe or I feel threatened is the most likely to come up. And like I said, we didn't realize that we were doing this until years in, but essentially we, it's not that we don't share what we're scared about or what we need you know, or what we're scared of not, you know, having enough of like that gets communicated. But when we are in a decision-making process around something financial, I am arguing for what she will benefit her. And she is arguing for what will benefit me financially. And like, lo and behold, it is so profound. So literally all the arguments that we have are basically me being like, no, you get more money. And she's like, no, you get more money. And I'm like, no, you get more money. And like, this is why you should get more money. No, this is why you should get more money. So you can imagine what has happened at the level of our partnership where our nervous systems feel so safe with each other. We don't go into a fight or flight threat response at the level of our own relationship. I'm curious what's landing out there is as you hear this. Lauren, are you noticing anything? And maybe that will give um, some women the time to collect their yeah. thoughts. Yeah, yeah of course. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean um, yeah, just thinking about this in a slightly, I suppose it's like from a slightly different perspective. Um, is how everything you said is so useful and so apparent to how communities thrive and how they can actually operate at their best. And obviously that's an interweaving of um, men and women, mixed genders in that sense. But what's I suppose really apparent to me is also the beauty of the aspects of the feminine energy that this is embodying and how often that can be overlooked and that can often fall to the wayside and actually the importance of being able to embody that within 
the structured aspects can really provide that support that allows the flourishing and allows the actual the building of the relationships, the networks, and how that that then seeps out into the wider community. And, and, you know, that's really magical. And that's what is missing in a lot of places is that sense of, um, of connection and ability to trust in another and receive generosity and give generosity, Mm -hmm. even when times are really, really hard. And I think that was a very key, a key point there. And also the role of the ego. I mean, we all have one. So it's very interesting how, um, how we have to be mindful to keep that in check and when it's being activated. But yeah, mm-hmm. I'd love to open it out and hear what other people are, what it's bringing to the table for everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. One woman in chat says, this is my nervous system speaking with that initial sweat equity Elizabeth gave. Was it compensated later or was it given generously honoring all the work Micah had invested prior to Elizabeth joining? We might, I might just table that for one second, just to um, keep us on this piece around the financials. One woman says, no need to defend or resist. Um, What a great foundation for limitless business growth. Yeah. Awesome. Anyone want to speak into this space around what's happening for you as you think about always arguing for the other partner's financial interest? Yeah, Anna, let me unmute you. Yeah, I think what I'm just noticing is how generosity breathes abundance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the interesting thing, right, is that part of the intersection, right, of where we weren't just frivolously abandoning ourselves is that the company had really strong financial housekeeping and health, right? So I wasn't arguing for Elizabeth to get something that was out of integrity or financial responsibility at the level of the company. It was like inside of what the company's financial house is, I was arguing for her to benefit most and she was arguing for me to benefit most. But the spot, like the back spine was also just really good financial management as the back, as the context for those conversations. And so then the generosity could create abundance rather than generosity, basically propelling kind of irresponsible, impulsive, or kind of unproductive financial outcomes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, Dana. I, um, it sounds like this generosity towards each other just emerged organically because of the the generosity that was there from the start with each um, small project you took on. And I guess I'm just wondering how, um, I don't know, it just sounds like sort of a, a ingredient that needs to be there, but is there a way that you intentionally can cr- set out to have this ingredient? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is kind of a, what could be kind of a fluffy um, answer, but I actually think is the truth, which is like, how much do you genuinely have another person's best interest at heart? Like how much have you come to sort of a developmental stage as a person that sees that what is good for them is good for the whole and that you are backing that? both because it's good for them and because you know when the whole thrives, that's when you also win the most. And if you can be in that place, then I think this is how it intentionally happens that you can give give this level of generosity. And if you're not experiencing that in partnership, 
it's like turning the mirror. This is that part of like the, the crucible of letting yourself be informed, getting the feedback of information that like, oh my gosh, I don't feel generous. I feel like I am fighting for my own survival. I have a question, Micah, that might be useful for, for other people. Um, is if you seem to have that had that quite naturally, I'm assuming through your own experiences, your trial and error in business and other life experiences, if people are kind of relatively new to this concept, they feel like it's like it's a yes, they want to embody it, but there's a nervousness or a, an uncertainty around how to do it. Where where could they start to really engage with? developing the skill set and starting to feel comfortable in actually embodying it fully. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of potential really good answers to that question, but to just kind of weave one of the things that we've been talking about the whole time is like part of the foundation of that process is actually developing financial literacy skills that actually have your financial house in order. So um, if, if your financial house is kind of a mess and you are actually fighting for your survival, it is going to be so much harder to not be in scarcity or threat in a business partnership. And again, finding a business partnership, a business partner whose financial house is in order means that you're both coming in with kind of a um, an infrastructure that is actually factual for helping your nervous system relax, be relaxed. Because no matter how much we do personally, anytime that we're terrified of our own survival, we're going to have like a threat response come up that contracts our system and makes it harder to be generous. What do you think about that, Lauren? I don't know that's really beautiful and I think it's yeah I think it's very true it is that sense of what it triggers in me is that we need to know ourselves first and, and we need to also be very upfront with ourselves and have all of our cards on the table with ourselves first before we can even ask somebody else to to show theirs really and I think that's a huge part of actually there is sometimes a sense of dishonesty that we maintain within ourselves um, and that can often keep us you know away from the things that we want but also um avoiding and in that survival mode mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah totally totally um for time's sake i'm going to move to our next slide we have two more things that we want to share um specifically and then we can open it up a little more um elizabeth you want to speak to this yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, when we came into partnership, um, before we even legally had a partnership, and we showed up with so much vulnerable generosity with each other, um, we created a level of intimacy, unlike anything I had had in my life before. And um, we realized quite quickly that um, our financial lives were completely entwined, right? And just like in any system, um, you know, we have separate bank accounts, personal bank accounts, but in a way it's like every financial decision that we make impacts the other. And, um, you know, neither of us come from family money. Neither of us are expecting a big, any kind of inheritance. Um, Micah is, uh, single and I have a lovely husband, but I'm really the, the one I'm responsible for figuring out the financials. So like, we don't have this huge network of, um, of, of financial security or any kind of financial wind behind our wings, <laughs> beneath our wings, except through each other. And so as we found that like, 
um, we could create results together in Wink and we were our, our completely inside each other's financial lives, we discovered pretty quickly that we had the potential to build a financial life together. And I call her my financial wife or my business wife. And um, we um, make decisions to invest in things together, to save in things together. We'll have meetings together before we make a personal investment in our own lives to say, hey, here's what I'm thinking of doing. What does this feel like to you? You know, um, and we will look at our portfolios together. So we become like financial um, accountability partners as well, where we'll look at okay, well, what percentage of your portfolio is going to this and how big is your IRA? And like, you know, a way that we're, um, we're creating a, a life together, you know? Um, so it's very tied obviously to our financials. And it's also really deeply tied to our deepest creativity where we um, advocate really strongly for each other's creative fulfillment. And so it's like, okay, this is what Wink is now, but like, what is in your heart? What is in your soul to create next? And how can we make that happen? Both in the financial realm and in the creative realm. And not that they're separate. I mean, they're, they're very intertwined. Um, I don't know what else you want to say there. You're on mute. You're on mute, babes. <laughs> We started with a business partnership in a specific company as business partners. And as we built together, we became financial life partners. So an example of what we mean by that is like, and it's been a shift over time. And I will tell you, it's changed. It's required a, a, a deep change in my perception and orientation. So like, before this happened, I had my savings and my investments and my net worth. And so I knew that if the shit hit the fan, this is what I could liquidate to stay in order to stay off the streets. Right. But as my understanding of Elizabeth being my life, my financial life partner has come online. It means that if shit hits the fan for Elizabeth, my net worth is in the ecosystem to come and back her in the crisis too. But that also means that Elizabeth's financial net worth to some degree is also in my ecosystem to come and back me. That might never happen. Hopefully it doesn't, right? But what it, it has felt energetically so novel to explore this other template for relationship in business that is kind of like a marriage like what what i just described is what a is what spouses would do for each other right um and so to find that resilience as friends as business partners has been a really paradigm shifting process that we've been in. Which, um, you know, is where we have really over time started to understand our business as an ecosystem and experience our business and our relationships as an ecosystem. And so Elizabeth and I are business partners, but we also have another core member of our team who is also largely a breadwinner in her family. She lives in the Philippines. And so she's part of this too. And um, so, you know, there's lots of things that we do that, but that like cultivates this experience of an ecosystem. So one is arguing what's best for each other financially. You know, two is like stepping into an experience of backing someone else financially in crisis and being backed, like knowing that's part of the resilience. Um, but it also shows up as like, all of us inside of our company basically get paid equally according to um, any exchange rates between us and our um, 
our business manager in the Philippines, like we get equal bonuses, we get equal salaries. So it's like everybody in the ecosystem is getting the same amount of, of soil and water and sunlight to make sure that all of our forest is as strong and resilient as possible. Um, and, and again, just like really taking on the orientation that like, if you, you had this beautiful metaphor, Elizabeth, around our, our ecosystem as a forest and it's, do would you share that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure most of you are aware by now about the research that's come out in the past several years about the intelligence of, of trees and how they care for each other and how if one tree is in stress or disease that the other trees in the forest will send nutrients down through the roots to support that tree. Um, and, and, and we don't know why that happens, obviously, but we could uh, assume that there's a couple of reasons like that nature intrinsically knows that caring for a part is caring for the whole. And mm -hmm. if that tree goes down and there's suddenly a hole in the forest, um, it, it makes every other tree more vulnerable. And so it is in the best interest of all the trees sending their nutrients down to keep every tree in the forest thriving. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, we see so many examples of beautiful things like this in all different natural ecosystems. And it's, it's just mind blowing when you start, when you start learning about the symbiotic relationships that exist in, in um, non-human nature. I'm not going to say nature because we are nature <laughs> in the non-human um, parts of nature. Um, and so I think even six, almost seven years, six years later, almost seven years later, Micah has continued to surprise me with how deeply she um, embodies these values and practices what she preaches. Like literally this summer, I'm going to just tell a very vulnerable story. I was having like a, a, a panic attack, probably the first time in my life I've had a panic attack about um, my personal finances when I got like my construction bill for um, building our home in Costa Rica and um, just feeling the real gravity of it in a new way. Like I, I was, it was the middle of the night in Costa Rica and I was flat out panicking. I thought I had food poisoning because I realized it was like, am I, are my kids going to be homeless because I made this decision that I can't actually afford and blah, 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 blah. And I call Micah. I'm like, God, my husband's trying to come for me. I'm like, I got to call my husband. <laughs> and she's like, honey, I can liquidate my IRA and your family will be safe. We've got at least six months of runway. And I'm like, what, what, like, it's like not surprising, but also so radically surprising to hear a human who is not your life partner, like not your husband, not your wife say that. And I know that she means it. You know, and it's just like, I i mean, thankfully, I haven't had to take her up on that offer. <laughs> but honestly, just to feel um, that level of family, you mm -hmm. know, but she is my family, even more so than my siblings, like, my <laughs> siblings would never do that for me. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's because, you know, women in community was born from Micah's deep, deep belief and embodied knowing that communities take care of each other. And that's the best way to care for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it's not just marketing. It's not just like some fun, sweet thing that Micah came up with. Like she lives it every single day. And I get to be, you know, the number one recipient of her living in alignment with her values. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's gone both ways again and again and again. And um, just for time's sake, I know we're a couple minutes over, so I'll just say this in closing. Like that story that she gave is an example, but like what's really happening to see our organization as an ecosystem, like those trees, is to understand like the human nervous system really well, actually. 
And that when the human nervous system is, when my nervous system or when Elizabeth's nervous system or when our business manager, Christine's nervous system is in a fight, flight, freeze, threat response, that is like the tree that is sick, basically, that needs a lot of resources and support. Because until our nervous system is back in a state of safety we cannot produce good anything. Like our perception is skewed. Our emotions are skewed. Our behaviors are skewed. Our ability to move forward and make decisions. All of it kind of unravels when any of our nervous systems are in kind of a, a really scared, unsafe feeling. So the first thing that needs to happen is the ecosystem comes in to support the nervous system that doesn't feel safe. And then from there, we actually can perceive all kinds of solutions and take action. But that's how, like, that's part of what we mean by understanding our, our business as an ecosystem. And so what is it going to take to bring nervous systems back into ease and safety and whatever it takes is basically worth it because no good outcomes come until that occurs um elizabeth i don't know if you have to run right now but i'm happy to stay for a couple more minutes if there's any um reflections or discussion that wants to happen and laura lauren if you need to end us right now for time's sake please do yeah it's fine i was going to say we could take a five more minutes if everyone's comfortable to do so in case there's any questions or reflections so yeah if anybody has anything they want to say or share or ask feel free to put your hands up now so we can invite you up One woman in chat. Oh yeah, great, Isabella. All right, thank you so much for this uh, story. I think I'm probably very uh, loud here in this place, but I was just wondering how much of your program is about dealing first with that safety because I'm all with you and I'm in a, also a, a interesting community of people, a collective of people. And there are different parts of us and of that system that suddenly are on high alert and everyone needs to shift around for that person or people. And it, it does shift around and we learn better each time how to be there for each other. But I think it's so essential that I can't imagine dealing with any kind of business offering or training without part of that training being about this showing up. So I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about that. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. You want to take that, Elizabeth? Yeah, I think what I want to say about that, and I, I would be curious what yours is, Micah, is that um, we have a very cautious sales process. Um, I think a lot what differs, one of the things that differs um, with Wink and how we teach is that um, there's a lot of marketers out there um, doing whatever they can to make a sale and for better or for worse, not to say that they're bad people, but we're very cautious about who we invite into our program. And one of the things we're really tracking for, and we ask a lot of questions about is to make sure a woman has a way she is sor sourcing her safety financially because, um, you know, building a successful business that pays for your life regularly is going to take six months, 12 months, maybe longer, depending on your situation. And so we're really clear with women from day one that if you don't know how you're covering your basic needs, this is not the time for you to work with us. Mm -hmm. So either you need family support, you need savings, you need a part-time job, make sure that your basic needs are stabilized before um, coming to work with us. And that's a way that we can feel an integrity um, as well. We don't want to make um, someone's financial situation untenable. It is mm -hmm. not, that's not what we want in our business. So um, mm -hmm. like a thoughts on that? Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, to take what Elizabeth said and transfer it into like an organization, like a bunch of people building an organization, like you referred to, it's like, again, that's where like 
one of those things is I would definitely always look at doing collaboration or partnership with people who have their financial house in order, because in our modern day, it is where some of the most intense survival threats come up at a nervous system level that just everything can go haywire out of. Um, and and then it's like this dance, right? Like we don't formally train around nervous system in our teaching, but we are deeply informed about this. And so at an organization level or a collaboration or a project level, like there's always this dance between people having skills to work with their own emotional regulation and then the group also tracking for where emotional regulation is getting out of whack, regardless of who is in that role, but tracking that the group, like the group nervous system is not healthy right now. And it doesn't matter who is in that seat. It's like the group ecosystem is not in a nervous system regulation place. Amazing. Thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions? I'm just mindful that we've gone over a little bit. But, um, I don't want anyone to feel like they're left with something they really would like to share. So if any, does anybody else have anything they'd like to ask or share? No one, no one seems to be coming up. So um, Micah and Elizabeth, do you have any sort of final words before we before we end this call? Anything you kind of would like to end on a short summary the key takeaway or my summary is like financial and legal agreements before any collaboration is non-negotiable um investing in an ecosystem that has all the nodes with financial responsibility gives the best possible nervous system ecosystem right um and uh, those are my two takeaways as you're exploring partnerships. Yeah, and really trust your gut and your intuition. Mm -hmm. You know, there's often, whether it's a business partnership or just any other kind of opportunity, even a customer, there's often collaborations that look good on paper, but like some part of you, something like just feels off. Like, no, mm -hmm. trust that. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then the third piece is that because a group dynamic, whether two or many, can get into this like endlessly processing experience without moving results forward. That's where what Elizabeth and I did, where we got a simple, tiny goal with specific results that we wanted to accomplish and a very modest financial and legal agreement that supported that allowed us to not stay in endless processing before we could get anything accomplished. So I think that can be really, really valuable um, to reconcile how not to get endless processing with just and kind of get drained in the process. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you both so much for your time and your energy and for everyone that's shown up today. It's been really, really enlightening, really useful and very transferable um, out to, to the wider Life Itself audience and I'm sure to the rest of your network as well. So we will let you know when it's up and available on YouTube site. Um, and yeah, in the meantime, I just, yeah, we'll just say a final thank you um wishing everyone a lovely I think it's your afternoon um or going into your afternoon where you are so thank you so much and yeah we will hopefully touch base again soon okay thank Take you bye. bye bye